Good. We were just, you know, in person at Wisconsin and now here we are. How you doing? Good. It's always fun to uh, see you in person and now we get to do it virtually. But I love that you've been hitting the road so much. You guys have been crushing it with all the content. All over the place. Thanks. And you two obviously covering a slew onslaught of games this season. So the best person to talk to when it comes to the overall parity that we've seen so far this year, this team, this year has been crazy. Not even just the growth of the sport, but how good a lot of teams are. It's not just the best teams in the nation anymore. Well, I think that's what's made this season so exciting is I feel like in years past, we've seen, you know, one, two, three, maybe be really exponentially better than everyone. And, you know, of course we do have a few really good teams that are really tough to beat, but those kind of five through 20 teams, it feels like it's really anyone's game. And a lot of those middle teams that have either finished middle of their conference over the last few years, or even near the bottom, like they're getting better and better and really pushing some of these top teams. And we've seen crazy upsets and some really close matches. So and then on top of that, just the growth we've seen this season has been so encouraging. You just called a game on Fox that was over a million viewers, the highest watched volleyball game in history. I mean, what's it mean? Oh, it's so cool. I mean, just to see the progress that the sport has made, even this season alone, we've seen viewership records shattered. We've seen attendance records absolutely blown out of the water. So to see a game put on a major network, you know, one of the the major four, it's been so exciting to see the investment that's been put into the sport. But a lot of that is from people taking notice, whether that's fans, um, you know, TV networks, finally noticing that when you invest into the sport, you can finally get those returns out of it. And I think that's what's that's what's made it so fun. And, you know, the game itself wasn't necessarily the greatest match, uh, but to kind of be a part of it was was really cool. And just the event as a whole. Yeah. And the 92,000 one at Nebraska. OK, speaking of Nebraska, let's get into the nitty gritty. We just saw the one two battle Nebraska, Wisconsin uh, went to five. We thought Wisconsin was going to pull it out in four these are the top two teams in the nation, in my opinion. What do you think? Yeah, I think that Nebraska and Wisconsin right now feel like they're kind of strides ahead of everyone else. And honestly, I mean, I, I was surprised to see the result that happened. I mean, if maybe if you didn't watch the game or were just looking at the box score, maybe stats, you know, Wisconsin outplayed Nebraska in almost every single category. But what Nebraska did was make those big plays in really big moments. You know, when you're in, entering a fourth set, you have a freshman outside like Harper Murray who's hitting negative up until the end of the fourth and then goes off for seven kills in the fifth set. That was the difference for Nebraska. They had players that were able to step up in the big moments. When you enter a fifth set, it's really a coin flip, especially when you have two good teams duking it out of, of who's going to come out on top. But you saw so much grit from Nebraska and just will to win that game. And, I mean, that was one of the most exciting environments I've ever been a part of. And to have it at Devaney where those fans are so rabid about the sport all the time, that was the loudest by far that I'd ever heard them, which was really fun. It is crazy, the freshmen, the way that they responded. You think about this entire starting lineup being Bergen Riley, one of the best setters in the country now, a freshman leading this team. Harper Murray, who was hitting negatives and then responds. Normally they would you know, shy away from those big moments, but none of them do. It almost, in the beginning, I was like, how is Nebraska going to play in the tournament with such a young core? But after seeing that matchup, I was like, I'm not even worried about them being freshmen. Yeah, it's it's funny watching the group because when they first started out, I remember going to a few of their non-conference games early on. It was interesting to see how they were adjusting to bigger opponents. What I was really impressed with was how, even when the opponents got better, they raise their level of play. And throughout non-conference, we saw the opponents get a little bit tougher and the team got better. When you have freshmen stepping onto the court of one of the most, you know, historic programs, there's a lot of pressure on them to be really good. You're the number one recruiting class. You know, they had the number one recruit of pretty much every position coming in and they're all stepping on the court. And to watch them improve as the season has gone on has been really cool. And in those big moments, you're right. They don't shy away from them. Like they own those moments. They want the ball. And uh, it's been super fun to watch them grow into, into their own, their freshman season. Yeah. And Wisconsin too, just getting better. I was watching practice on Saturday before the border battle. They're just taking set after set from yeah. MJ Izzy, just really trying to work on those connections every single time they were setting the ball. They were giving them little tweaks, right? I wanted a little bit higher. I wanted a little bit closer to the net. And then obviously it wasn't as competitive of a matchup, but the they hit so efficiently. I just think they've been focusing on that. And I'm excited to see uh, the rematch. 
Yeah, well, it's, it's been fun for Wisconsin because it feels like they've been dominant since pretty yeah. much the beginning. And now that they have those massive pieces, I think by far they're the most physical team in the country right now. You know, when you have a front line that could be 6'9", Anna Smrek, 6'7", Carter Booth, and 6'4", Sarah Franklin, like, what are you going to do as a defense? You, I mean, exactly. especially against Minnesota, even I was catching up with Kylie Murr after the game, and I'm like, what did you do when you were – defending some of these balls when you know they're going right over your block and she's like you just hope you're in the right spot because there's literally Mm -hmm. nothing you can do against them um but they've been fun to watch and you know of course they dropped that match to Nebraska but they're they're heating up and they're showing their dominance night in and night out how do you beat a team as physical as Wisconsin obviously Nebraska did it but they're pretty physical too but when you think about how physical Wisconsin is like what do you do yeah, I think part of it is is speed and finesse. So, you know, you want to try to run the fastest offense that you can to try to throw yeah. off that physicality a little bit. That's that's what you can beat size with. You know, you run the offense a little bit quicker. You might be able to get a few more holes in that block. So, um, you know, as we look down the line, I'm thinking of a team like Oregon who runs a lightning fast offense. I would probably have them up against Wisconsin as the team that could potentially upset them in the tournament. Of course, we saw Nebraska upset them already just making those big plays. But where Wisconsin can struggle at times is with that really quick offense, you know, getting those middles to close and in that backcourt. I mean, they're picking a lot of stuff up, but it's really difficult when you have some some big holes in the block. All right, let's talk some upsets this season. And in doing that, we're going to talk about the Pac-12, which you just brought up with Oregon. So ASU just upset Stanford a sweep, which was crazy. They also beat Oregon. So That was crazy. We had USC and Oregon State over Washington State, just a slew of upsets in the Pac-12. Yeah, I think the Pac-12 has been so fun to watch. And, you know, in their final season of play, like so many of these teams just want to go absolutely all out. And what I've loved from Arizona State is in the beginning of the season, you know, they were one of the only undefeated left, I think, you know, until about 15 or 16 games in. And they hadn't necessarily played anyone big in that non-conference. So a lot of us were questioning how good they really were. And then they go on to, you know, they drop a match and then they get swept by Oregon or they get swept by Stanford and they come out and sweep Oregon. They sweep Stanford right after that. And so what we saw was, okay, no, this team's actually legit. Maybe they didn't test themselves that much during non-conference, but what they got out of that was the confidence to play in these really big Pac-12 matchups where they really believe that they can beat any of these teams. Um, So it's been fun to watch their progression as, as the season's gone on too. Yeah. And I talked to Marta Levinska after that win and I was like, how'd you guys do it? And she was just like, we honestly just beat them and serve receive. And, and they were, they were just like ready for it. She was like, we just had the mentality that we could beat this team. And after we won the first two sets, we didn't want to let them back in. They dominated in the third. They didn't even let Stanford get to 15. I think they scored 14 in the third set. So that's just crazy. Um, Another one I want to get you to talk about is NC State over Louisville. So Louisville's now back in the top three after Stanford lost, but that was a pretty bad loss for Louisville. Yeah. And I I think a lot of people, you know, I know we do the rankings every week and are trying to figure out our our top teams and all that. And for me, that upset for NC State over Louisville like really weighs a lot and I know it was you know a few weeks ago pretty early on during conference play and how much does that factor in into how good this Louisville team is you know every team's going to have a slip up you look at a team like Texas they lose to Long Beach State of course you know they're out with Asia O'Neill and that's a little bit different because it was earlier on but I think as we go to the end of the season I always really look at like what's this team team's potential and how are they trending For a team like Louisville, they're absolutely trending upwards. So, yeah, they have a little hiccup against a team like NC State, but I think their potential is is higher than a lot of of these other teams still. Yeah, and then they come and they sweep a really good pit team, and they've got them again. So I'm excited to see how um, the ACC shakes out. Okay, so national championship contenders. Um, Obviously, we already kind of talked about Nebraska, Wisconsin, Louisville. Who do you think has a chance of genuinely winning the national championship? Like not just, you know, being in the final four, making a run in the tournament, but winning it. Yeah, I mean, Wisconsin, Nebraska, for me, are are picks that I would say could easily make it to the championship game. I honestly think the only other team that I've seen this year that has the potential to actually win would be Stanford. Coming into the season, they were my pick. I think the personnel that they have with Kendall Kip, who's one of the best players in the country. You know, you have one of the best setters in the country with Cami Miner. I mean, I think the best setter in the country. They're just so gelled and locked in. It worries me, though, that we've seen them slip up a few times. But where I think they have an advantage come tournament time is how, 
you know, experienced this team is. It's a, it's a team full of complete veterans. And so to have them in tournament time, you know, last season they got upset by San Diego. They don't want to feel like that ever again, especially on their home court. So you have these veterans coming back that I think will be really dialed in come tournament time. And they also have the personnel and kind of that perfect balance of physicality and ball control mm-hmm. to hang with, you know, those other top teams. Yeah, in terms of them slipping, it's like, I just want to see a little bit more fire from them, you yeah. know, like a little bit more will to win. They have, they're here. Yes, they're very just Not a lot of that. Um, yeah. So, so that's what I want to see. Like, I want to see like a team that refuses to be denied, like Nebraska, like that, that game was so not pretty, right? But like, they came out on top. They got it done. They were yeah. taking big swings when they needed to. And and that's what matters sometimes when you're playing really good teams. So that's what I want to see from Stanford. I was talking about it earlier. Um, it's kind of funny to think that players like Kendall Kipp, Katie Baird, um, McKenna Vicini, they were freshmen when the Catherine Plummer and that crazy senior class won the title. Um, and to think that they were on the bench and then to go down in the way that Stanford did, they weren't ranked. They didn't make the tournament. And then they, this class built them back up all the way. And now they're going to compete for a championship and it's going to yeah, be them that are the superstars. So it's like, you got to want fun, it. Yeah. What a fun storybook ending for those players as well, yeah. you know, kind of send them off on their way. And that's a team that I think is also really easy to root for because the players on that team are also just really good people. And Kevin Hamley, yeah. I mean, he's one of the nicest, best coaches to work with as well. So that's a team it's like you just you feel like you want them to do well and reach that potential because we've seen it from them where they have these crazy moments of greatness absolutely I completely agree um okay so let's move on to teams with a really high ceiling for the postseason we talked about this a little bit last week so I want to hear your take on it um and what you think here yeah, I, there's a few teams that I think could make a deeper run than we expect. Now, a lot of these teams that I'm talking about are already ranked, so maybe it's not that big of a surprise. But I honestly think um, a few of them. So Oregon, based on how quick that offense is, I think if they're able to stay in system, that's a team that could absolutely upset some people. And I wouldn't be surprised to see them in a Final Four. Another team, I think Georgia Tech could make a deeper run than people think. We've seen them have incredible games. We've also seen them waver at times. Uh, you know, they have a a mix of a group in terms of experience, but what they do so well is they're so balanced and they have incredible pins who can put the ball down from any spot. Uh, so I, I really like Georgia tech and in, in what they're doing. Another They've team got great think, servers too. I'll just throw crazy, that in. Incredible servers. And that, that does yeah. wonders in the tournament, especially, you know, when you're playing some of these teams that maybe haven't been tested as much from the service line. Uh, that's, that's definitely huge. I think the last team, I would say would be Arkansas. I think they've, you know, made a really good run this season, giving teams trouble with, you know, with their finesse, having some shorter outside hitters and and defensively just digging in. And I think what they do so well is frustrate opponents and just keep the ball in play and force you to make an error. Um, And I think as we've seen some of these players get older throughout that program, it'll be fun to see that experience kind of level out and and see what they do come postseason. Yeah, that just makes me bring up, the, the SEC is so fun this year. I mean, so fun. I just, you don't even know what's happening in the SEC. We went, we went from Florida being like the biggest surprise of the season to falling off when they, they, they're suffering a lot of injuries, which I really feel for them on that front, but hopefully they'll come back stronger in the next few years. But gosh, Kentucky, horrible start to the season and now on the rise. I mean, I'll talk about teams on the rise and we can lead off with Kentucky in the way that they have responded this year. Oh, it's been crazy. I mean, I had this team in non-conference twice and they started like two and six and now they're nine yeah. and one in conference play. Now I will say they do have a pretty tough schedule remaining. They play Florida twice, Mizzou, Auburn, Texas A&M, Georgia, Arkansas. So by no means do they have an easy stretch, but the way that they've adjusted and adapted to losing the beginning of the season, not doing well at all. It's been so fun to see some of those veteran players really come alive and kind of wrangle that group together and not get too down on themselves. Um, I mean, I I think that's another team where I think those players are just so fun to watch and so easy to root for that you love seeing a team like Kentucky kind of get back to where they were, you know, after having won that won that 2020 title. But again, they have a really tough stretch coming up. You know, looking at the SEC, you have nine teams in the top 60 in RPI. Right. Like you can't take a night off at all because anyone's going to try to win. There's so many tournament bids on the line for the SEC and it's going to be tough for Kentucky, but they are absolutely heating up, and it's been fun to watch. What are your thoughts on Minnesota? Um, yeah, 
I'll, I'll just let okay. you go. And then I'll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's, it's been an interesting team because, you know, you would say technically they're, they're having a bit of a down year. And what I will say is I think with the new coaching staff, you have new systems in place and all the players are trying to adjust really quickly. Also with the schedule that Minnesota had, they had one of the toughest non-conference schedules in the entire country. So when you have, you know, not necessarily new pieces, but a new staff, you know, with new philosophies and systems in place, you have to kind of get used to it really quickly. It was really tough for them to do thrown into the fire. Once Big Ten play started, they started to get a little bit better. Then Melanie Schaffmaster got sick. They lose a game to Maryland. They lose a game to Rutgers. I will say, I think they bounced back really well. I had them actually twice in the last week. I had them at Purdue on Thursday. And they played some of the best ball I've ever seen. You know, they got swept in that game. But during set one, they hit like 500, had 22 kills in just the first set. Set two, I think, hit over 300. So we were seeing progress with this team. And against Wisconsin, you know, the first set, I think they just kind of wanted to watch that. It was a pretty bad first set for them. But set two and set three, like, they're grinding out there. They're hitting nearly 300 mm-hmm. against the number two team in the country. This is a team that could be really scary as their offense is starting to click. Melanie Shaftmaster is working her way back to health. Taylor Landfair finally looks like Taylor Landfair again. They adjusted her set a little bit, and she's going mm-hmm. up and over pretty much everyone. Uh, so that's a team that I think in the last few weeks of the season, you might be surprised with with what they do. Yeah, I think it's one that surprised us early at how much they were struggling because they have the pieces. I mean, you bring back the Big Ten player of the year and, and you're losing so many games. You bring in Kylie Murr, Erica Davis from from Ohio State, and you think you've got it all, right? But they're I don't know what was missing. I was trying to figure it out, and I haven't watched them in person as much as you have. But I was like, is it the chemistry? What is it? Yeah, I think, you know, I will say from watching their team, I think the offense just looked a little bit off. I mean, I will say Melanie Schaffmaster has a very big brace on her leg, which she's had for a while, kind of going through some lower leg injuries. Um, She doesn't look exactly like the Melanie Schaffmaster that we've seen. But also, I will say, I mean, last season they had a player like Carter Booth that was able to pick up a lot and, and, you know, do a lot of things. And now having her at Wisconsin, that was a really big hit for them, for a team that's trying to establish a middle attack and, they just don't necessarily have the the big pieces to do it up front. So they get really pin heavy. Yeah. You know, I, sometimes that's a piece that I always forget. I feel like Carter yeah. Boots been at Wisconsin forever, but she has. <laughs> okay. Um, let's talk about, and this is really a hard topic to talk about. We talked about at the beginning of the season, our player of the year candidates. And when we came yeah. in, we were like, Kendall Kip, duh. But Obviously. now what do you think? Yeah, I, gosh, I feel like I've been having this conversation a lot just nationally and within conferences. And I will say my my pick right now still for player of the year is Kendall Kipp. I think she's been the most consistently dominant player that we've seen on one of the top teams. And, you know, it becomes really important at the end of the season as we get deeper in the tournament. You know, you pretty much have to be on one of the top teams to win that award. And I would say Stanford has one of the best um the probability of of going there late now another few players that I think potentially could be there I think Sarah Franklin gets a little bit buried with Wisconsin because of how balanced and dominant they are but I mean seeing her live against some of these other players I think she's one of the best outside hitters if not the best outside hitter in the country she passes really well she's tall physical she's able to go up and over everyone I mean the numbers she's putting up on a team that relies on balance are really impressive um, another player, I think Maddie Skinner is doing an awesome job at Texas. We've seen that from her from the last few years. I think it'll depend on how deep Texas can go in the tournament. Um, but she's definitely, definitely someone that I, I could see making that campaign if, if they go deeper in the tournament, which we'll see. And I love the way that Maddie Skinner has adjusted to playing six rotations. It's almost like she just kind of filled in that really big shoe for uh, Logan Eggleston. And she's been doing it really well. And Texas is getting better and better. It stinks. We don't get to see them, you know, in in the big 10 or the 12 or something like that. They do have harder teams this year, but BYU, it's like those wins were great for them. And then all of a sudden BYU gets swept twice by Kansas State, and it's like, okay, now we can't even count that as a top yeah. 10, you know? I know. It's, it's tough with Texas because it feels like – because they don't have that one really big win, but they have yeah. a ton of smaller wins. You know, two wins over BYU, Houston, like all these teams. Baylor. Are, all these teams that are good teams, they're just not great teams. But to, to be fair, it's hard to win against any team. And when you have – especially their schedule, like those back-to-back days, and you're able to take care of opponents – 
you know, within a few days of each other. I, I honestly think that's it's really impressive because teams will make those adjustments really quickly. Yeah, for sure. And they they definitely have a high ceiling as well. You've got a lot of experienced players on there that won the national championship last year. Let's talk yeah. freshman of the year candidates. I think in the beginning of the season, I was like, how could it not be Florida's Kennedy Martin, right? I mean, she yeah. was balling out. She won ABCA National Player of the Week in, I think, the first week of play. And Florida skyrocketed to the top three teams in the nation. And it was mostly because of her dominating. But now that Florida's taking a step back, um, she's cooled down a bunch. So it brings in a lot of other freshmen. And you got to talk about Nebraska. I mean, they're loaded with incredible freshmen. I think, you know, two specifically, obviously Andy Jackson's doing an incredible job, but I, I think Bergen Riley, I, I think is one of the best setters in the country right now. She's absolutely top five, you know, her ability to take over a game. And, you know, if a setter's doing their job really well, a lot of times it goes unnoticed. And I think she's a player that goes unnoticed a lot because of how well she does and how well she balances that offense. And is just able to dominate in a really quiet way. Uh, she's doing phenomenal. You know, Harper Murray, they're outside. She's been a bit up and down this season. It's really tough as an outside hitter, though. When you come in, it's easier to dominate right away because teams haven't figured you out. We saw the same thing last season with Eva Hudson. You know, kind of take that dip during conference play. Super normal for an outside. A player like Harper Murray, too. That team has so much balance that they haven't had to rely on her as much. Um, but one other player that has just been an absolute stud and is hands down my favorite player to watch in the country is Chloe Chacoin yeah. from Purdue. I mean, she's 5'10". And when I say 5'10", she's like a very soft 5'10". I would say she's probably more like 5'8 and a half, 5'9". And man, she just flies up there. And the numbers that she's putting up for this Purdue team have been so much fun to watch. I mean, she's absolutely crushing it. And I don't necessarily think she would win the award just because, I mean, I, I can't see how it wouldn't go to Bergen Riley at this time. But I mean, Chloe Chacoin is, I think, the most fun player to watch. She's a she's a joy. She's similar to like Jill Gill at Arkansas, just that small, explosive outside that you just love watching. Yeah, reminds me of uh, Louisville, too, last year. Um, but another freshman I want to bring up is Olivia Babcock at Pittsburgh. So they've got a duo of freshmen that kind of came in and won the two uh, outside spots on the pins, Babcock and Tori Stafford. And they're best friends. They came from California. They played club, club together. Uh, when we visited Pitt, they were just like two pieces in a pod. I couldn't even oh. believe it. But Olivia Babcock especially – one, she's got a killer jump serve. I thought she was going to literally kill yeah. somebody at practice. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, again, it depends on if Pitt can make a big run on if she could win freshman of the year. But um, she's just another freshman I wanted to bring up for sure. Yeah, it's been a, it's fun watching that team because they have a good mix of experience and inexperience. Kind of, I feel like yeah. for the last few years, you know, we've seen all these experienced teams with, you know, the COVID season. But Pitt's been fun because they do have that balance. Okay, should we pick a final four for fun? Like, do we want to put ourselves through that? Or I don't really, but I'm like, I can't even think about what my top four teams would be outside of Wisconsin and Nebraska. I mean, I always struggle because I'm like, okay, I I have my top four teams, but like, that's not fun, you know, because no, I, yeah. I hope there's some upsets, like, you know, throwing a San Diego like we had last season. But I mean... I would expect, I mean, I don't want to say expect, but I wouldn't be surprised Stanford, Wisconsin, Nebraska. I think generally that's what maybe most people would say. That number four spot, I don't know. I could see it going to Louisville. They always surprise me. You know, I think they could beat teams with finesse and balance. Again, I wouldn't be surprised to see a team like Oregon in there as well. I think when you go deeper in the tournament, ball control becomes really important and they're they're really dang good at it. Yeah, and out of the middle, they're insane. Kara McGee and Carson Bacon are just so good. Two of the best middles I've seen this season. Yeah, yeah, and they, and, I mean, I think they have one of the best setters, too. Like, Hannah Bukas. Hannah Bukas, she's star. a baller. Yeah, Washington State, I would have picked them probably a little bit earlier, but yeah, I watched them against USC, and they just absolutely dominated the first two sets, but then really fell off, and then that seems to be the level – a play we've been seeing in uh, some of their recent upsets. If I had to pick a fourth team, gosh, drum roll. I, God, I don't even know. Um, well, it's, also, it's 
so hard because it, like picking those surprise teams, I, like I always think that the more experienced team is just going to go deeper. That's just typically what I think. And yeah, I, you know, I struggle with a team like Washington State because they've never been there before. Not not to say they're not a good team because they're obviously incredible. But you know, I I do think that experience really matters in the tournament. Um, but again, yeah. we'll see. So and when you I think of San Diego last team. year, I mean. Sorry, we lo- I lost you for a second. But when you think of San Diego last year, they had so many experienced players from other programs, and that almost is why it happened. Yeah, yeah. And to be fair, it's like I'm also talking about a team like Nebraska that has at any given time four freshmen on the court. So right. we'll see how that goes. Which what we've been learning is it doesn't even matter. And John Cook was like, yeah, they're not mature like at all, but um, they're, they're so good. His his post game interview, man, that guy. He's. I will say, for a lot of people don't know John Cook well. He's not. Not that he's not in the media, but he doesn't show his personality off a lot. Like that man's a major goofball, and I people people got to know. And I think you see it in some of these post game interviews. But he's um he's funny. Yeah, he's like, I don't know why you're calling them mature, Emily, but that's not what we have here. Um, okay, let's do um. I was going to do a snake draft, but before we do that, what matchups down the stretch are you most excited for with some big playoff implications? Turn oh, I feel like there's so many coming up. I mean, let's let's think conference by conference here because I wrote down a few. So obviously Nebraska-Wisconsin, the Black Friday game, I think is one of the biggest ones that everyone's looking forward to, the rematch. Um, I will say Penn State also hosts Wisconsin and Nebraska this Friday, and then they host uh, Wisconsin next Saturday. But I think those are two games that could be slept on the first time Penn State played Nebraska. Penn State did not have a good showing, but it's really tough to play at Rec Hall. Um, and so those could have implications. I think we look to ACC. Louisville's got some big ones coming up. You know, they got Georgia Tech on Friday, and then they play at Pitt and then Georgia Tech again. That's going to be really tough for Louisville to get out of those three, potentially go 3-0. and I think they obviously want to. Again, I think Georgia Tech's heating up. They could be could be tough to stop. Uh, Stanford has got Washington state on Friday, which I'm really excited for that rematch. Um, just because I think, you know, it's a different, different looks on both teams from what we saw just a few weeks ago. Um, Stanford, Oregon, I think again, will be, will be a big one because that, that first showing, you know, I thought Oregon played really well, but I don't think it was to the caliber of what we had seen from Oregon all season. Um, so we'll see there. And then you got nonsense happening in the SEC, you know, we got, Kentucky, Arkansas toward the end of the season, which is the one I'm actually looking forward to the most in in that conference. You know, Arkansas won the first in five. It was an absolute battle. Um, so that's one in the SEC that I'm really looking at because, you know, I, I don't know the last time Arkansas won an SEC title, if ever. But if ever. It's, I, I don't think they have. Um, I, I think, think it's have. crazy. It's always been Florida and Kentucky, and that's just yeah. so fun this year that we've got some other ones. I mean, Tennessee, Morgan Fingal, they're – they they've got a shot at doing it like being right in there in that conversation as well so um that's another team that could make a run in the tournament yeah absolutely okay to end it let's do a snake draft one more time do you want the first pick or the double second last time you went for double second but it's your pick I think I went double second again I I liked that I don't okay. feel that confident but uh we'll see okay um all right, I'm going to switch it up. Last time I took Kendall Kip number one overall as my opposite, but I hmm, who do I want first? <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to take Cami Minor number one overall as my setter. Okay, I'm not going to lie; she was going to be my um, pick if you didn't pick her. Okay, I'm glad I did then. Um. I, I'll take, I'll take Kip. Okay. You get another one. Um, and then for my second one, I will take, okay. I don't need to pick a setter because you already picked one. I will pick an outside and I will go with, I'm going to go with Sarah Franklin. I think she gives me physicality and she gives me good passing and I will always take a good passer. That's really annoying. I wanted to pick her. Um, oh, God. now you have Kip and Franklin. You've got a lot of firepower. Um, okay, I'm going to take... I want Carter Booth again. 
I took her last time, but I want that height in the middle. Yeah. I think she's she's definitely the the best middle. I yeah, think. and then um, I'm gonna take Jess Merzik as my first outside. Love that. Okay. Um. All right, I got an opposite and an outside. I should probably go middle. Um, I'll take Asia O'Neill. No question. There you go. And then. Should I go another? Oh, give me Lexi Rodriguez. Who am I kidding? Oh, come on. Dang. I shouldn't have given you the option for the second, <laughs> for the <laughs> double second. You know, it's, it's funny. Like I'm, I'm writing out, you know, you write out players and, and all of that. And I mean, Lexi Rodriguez is the first person I wrote down on this list, like just in general. And yeah. obviously there's a lot of good liberos in the country, but in my mind, she's just, could not be exponentially better than literally anyone. And I, I think if a libero could win player of the year, she should absolutely be in that conversation, but that would also never happen. So 100%. Um, Justin for liberos. Okay. If I better take a libero, then um, I guess I'll go with Elena Scott. Yeah. Um, okay. And then I need another outside and an opposite. Um, okay. When I think of the top right sides in the country, I'm like, I need to go back to my, my list that I did at the beginning of the season, top right sides, top opposites. Um, I would say think of an opposite. No, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not helping you out. What am I saying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take Maddie Skinner. And she's on the outside. So um, you're done on the outside. So I'm done on outside. So all I need now is an opposite. Okay. I could go. Is it my turn or your turn? Did you have two? I think I need one more. Um, Wait, you had Scott and Skinner, though. Oh, you're right. Go ahead. Whatever. Um, dang, I actually wanted Skinner. Um, I will take... Okay, I need a middle and an outside, and I will save my setter for last. So... Smart. Honestly, this could be a hot take. Um, For my middle, I'm deciding between... Kara McGee, but honestly, I'm gonna go with Sophie Fisher from Georgia. I like that pick. I, if you have not watched Georgia play, you gotta watch Georgia play because she's like six five. She goes up and over everyone. She's an incredible blocker. She leads a team in points. Like she's the only middle on the top, like whatever thirty in terms of points per set. She's an incredible blocker. She actually plays back row for them. After she comes in to serve, she'll play another rotation in the back row because she's that good and she'll hit out of the back row. Um, I'm obsessed with her. I think she's a phenomenal middle and I don't feel bad about that yeah. pick. That's a great pick. Last... She is, she's got 5.5, one five points per set. That's that's above Pendle Kip, by the way. And, and she's top she's, 14 for a middle. And she's a, she's a middle. It's crazy. Um, all right, another outside. Give me... You took Skinner. That's tough. Um, <laughs> I want to take Skylar Fields. Can I? Can I take a healthy Skylar Fields? Yes, you may. You you can take a healthy Skylar Fields. I'll give you that. Perfect. I will take a healthy Skylar Fields. All right. So for my last pick, or you do you have one more after me? Or are you done? Uh, I have, you have one Sutter. more. You have, you have two right now. Okay, um, so I need an opposite. So I'm between Merritt Beeson and Morgan Fingal at Tennessee. Um, I want to pick Fingal, but I might just go Beeson for more experience, more tournament experience. I'm going to go yeah. with Beeson. Okay, and then what am I missing? I, I need another middle. Um, I'll take care of McGee. Um, you have right? No, I uh, I was wondering uh, how you're gonna take I, that second opposite spot, and I thought you're gonna take Smrek, 
which is probably who I would have taken only yeah. because I can block from her, but Beeson also puts up bigger numbers. Yeah. I like Maybe that's I a good pick. Smirk. No, 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 no. I think that's an incredible pick. Um, I'm trying to think. You, you already have a big blocker. You don't need, you don't need some rec. Um, Okay. My sure. last is setter. Who am I? I'm, I'm between Pedraza and Riley. And I always like a more physical setter. I also think Bergen Riley at this point in time has better pieces to set. And I think Mac, I'm, I'm going to pick Pedraza. I want a physical setter. Okay. All right. I love doing this because we end up with such different teams every single time. I know. I was trying to like play around with it just a little bit, but uh, yeah. Okay. Is, this yeah, time this we're actually going to tweet it out. We always say we are, but I promise I will this time. Um, yeah. Okay. So we've got, you know, I like my team. I like, I've got Kara McGee, Carter Booth in the middle. Are you kidding? I with Cammy Miner it. as a setter, I've got some quick offense there. I know. I feel like. Yeah, you have, I'm not you have Franklin like, and Kip. Yeah, but um, see, Franklin and Merzik are not the same player, but they play pretty much the same way to me. So that that cancels out. I think in the middle, I mean, I think Booth is just exponentially better than like everyone right now. So I struggle there, but I don't know. I might I might beat you with finesse, but I probably wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good thing they'll never play. So we only have the internet to tell us who's right. All right. Well, Emily, thank you so much for joining. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, we've got a fun season, and we're coming up close on the postseason. So good stuff coming up, and it's always fun to break it down with you. I cannot believe we're already almost done with the season. The fact that it's one day away from November is absolutely wild. Um, but, no, thanks for having me. This is This is always fun. All right. Thanks, everybody. We're heading out.